course, Nectar. I hope it's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was saying um, with, yeah, within Trove, there's about 20 communities and those communities kind of come from three main networks. It was just like an interesting observation. So one network is the um, kind of collective intelligence. So CSC, OGM, um, Kiko Lab, um, systems innovators, I feel like are, you know, kind of have the, the main relation is very interested in like broad multidisciplinary uh, sense making and collective intelligence and projects and also mapping and weaving. I feel like all this kind of fits into, yeah, like a, you know, collective intelligence category. Um, I think a second one is kind of, um, regeneration and the environment. Um, so groups that are working like, for example, Regen Alliance or um, something like um, Chrysalis Network is like at the intersection of those two. Um, and then there's like Seaworthy, which is a ocean um, venture studio. And um, there's also some groups from Game B. Um, that are working in both collective intelligence and in the kind of like environmental impact. Um, and then the third, the third group is, it's kind of like the social, social justice. Um, so this is like cooperation Long Island, United Nations Association, um, there's a few different nonprofits that are kind of doing a, a lot of the like sort of in-system activism work um, and, and want to be able to coordinate across groups. And um, now I thought it would be kind of weird to have just one Google calendar of like all of these um, <laughs> with like all the events on it that like to just subscribe to to like have all the events on trove because i i was thinking like i really want to just have a google calendar with the events that are happening that i can like toggle on and off and so what i was thinking of doing and this is my idea that i just wanted to kind of put out there was like each one of these kind of like clusters almost makes some <laughs> some sort of like dao which um will basically have its own calendar and then groups can when they create an event choose to add it into that calendar if they want it to be public and then people could subscribe to the the different calendars and as more communities come on and we're like oh we don't actually fit into any one of those networks we want to like create our own then you could do that too um but i was thinking of having yeah like basically these like um kind of like networks where you put the public events and projects and people could join, like anyone could kind of view and see the public events in the in the network. Um, but that's kind of how I was thinking about like doing things. Cause we had like the CSC calendar um, and it was kind of like OGM and Kiko Lab and you know, some game B events. And um, I just feel like it's like setting the kind of boundaries on things is really interesting. And um, I feel like there needs to be a better way to like have kind of like a semi permeable membrane around thing events, but and not because I think communities are hesitant to just like, oh, just put everything totally open. So yeah, I'm wondering what you guys think about that. I've wanted something similar. Um, I my preference would be rather than this arbitrary category above sounds like you have orgs and then you're adding another category above. I'd almost want it to be that you can take an event, make it public, and then you're adding tags to it. And then there'd be, and maybe just start out with those three tags and that's three different calendars. Um, I mean, what I'd eventually like is me to go to a site, choose the tags I want included in my calendar and it would generate a URL. And this may be too much to ask, although I could technically help you do it. 
and then I would be able to see follow the public events that meet those tags, um, and then that could be used to do kind of what you suggested there. But so, so uh, my thoughts um, are: I, I wonder if so. So first of all, Vincent, it's really cool that that you've got that broad coalescing thing. Um, I wonder if. I, I wonder how those particular networks came to be. And um, so one thought is maybe it's a natural, a natural set of, you know, this is the, the way that people change the world or whatever. Um, another thought is that maybe it's the, um, maybe it's uh, uh, selection bias, essentially. And I'm not saying this in a bad way, um, but maybe you just naturally choose, you know, a thousand or two thousand organizations, and the ones that you're going to choose are going to cluster into collective intelligence, regeneration, environment, and social justice. And maybe, maybe that's what happened. <clears throat> um, uh, I, I think. So, I guess, I guess, if I could wave a magic wand and ask the Trove genie um, for something cool, um, I think you've uh to, to my mind it looks like you've done an amazing job of kind of uh curation and and you've added a lot of signal so that so, you know if i know that i'm i know that i'm a collective intelligence person so that, so then yes i want to see everything in the collective intelligence network um uh and the way to do that maybe is to have Vincent's curation of a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand organizations, and Vincent naturally curates into these three networks. Somebody else might curate it differently. Somebody might curate it by the way that the organizations work. For instance, nonprofits and for profits and NGOs and whatever, right? And maybe that's a different way that they see the world. And maybe that curation, I'm not saying that that particular curation is good, but maybe it's actually a, a curation model that you've discovered. And maybe it's that I want to kind of subscribe into Vincent's curation and see the world in these three things. Maybe I want to subscribe to, you know, somebody else's view of the world and, and look for adjacent adjacencies to me, which aren't collective intelligence adjacencies but like i said kind of you know all i'm interested in only in talking in ngos or something so so it's a, a cool framework a good observation and i don't know exactly where to go from that but So I started trying to make a, this morning, like after our, the mapping call, a kind of visual to um, <laughs> help condense the complexity using the analogy of like buildings and architecture. And so uh, let me kill my share. Uh, we lost the audio, Vincent. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Is this coming through clear? Yes. Okay. So this is kind of how I thought about it. So there um, are individuals <laughs> which have like a little house, which in individuals can be in many groups and groups can be in many commons. And so I'm thinking about the commons as like, what I was describing and Pete, what you mentioned and Bentley, what you mentioned is like a tag. So like a commons could be collective intelligence or it could be like New York, like it could be by location. So I guess people eventually could have their own framework for deciding what a commons is, but to start the commons would be like the major topics. And so groups can be in the kind of commons. And so I was thinking like each commons, like, you know, design regenerative can have its own calendar that both 
groups and individuals can put events into that calendar and then people could subscribe to it. And then I'm thinking of uh, the highest level is kind of like the concourse. And so the concourse is where like all of the events, projects, individuals, groups, organizations, resources that are public will be the co a concourse is like a place where all the roads kind of intersect. And so like if, if an individual or a group or someone inside of a commons like adds a resource and makes it public, then it goes into the kind of main directory of everything. Um, right. And then obviously it's like a glass building people could see in, but some rooms might be locked or some rooms might, you know, have information in them that are in these various levels of, um, like architecture, but might have privacy permissions. Like for example, you could put something inside of a group where only people who are in that group can see it, or you can put it like outside of the group on your front lawn where it's public, it's like attached to the group, but anyone can, can see it. Um, and yeah, so I'm thinking like the concourse like has like the public yes yeah, stuff. And then below the ground is like the more private things that are within the kind of groups and the same thing with like your house like you have like the you know your projects your events your resources that are public and then there's some stuff that's like private below the ground um so this is how i've been thinking about it from just like a yeah using a, a metaphor of um architecture to, to talk about how the information architecture is and and trying to make it also easy for non-technical people to like understand like you know when you create a group like do you want your door to be locked? Do you want your door to be unlocked, but closed? Or do you want it to be like wide freaking open? Um, and like, you know, how do we make it easy for people to understand like where information is going and, and, how, um, and how it gets shared, not only, you know, within this group, if it's public, but also within these other um, spaces. So I think that's really a nice, uh, it's, really a, it's really a fun diagram for, one, for sure. I mean, I like the, the visual. The thing, here's a question. What happens, you know, I come in, I'm wandering around. What happens if I bump into something and I want to learn, what did I just bump into? So I, I'm trying to think of uh, somebody who's new, who's exploring, and things are open all of a sudden they're not open i mean what what my experience has been that people create um say boundaries around what they're doing and not all of it is explicit it's like a general understanding just like i mean this came up in uh, for me at least in the matter most for like ogm it's like there's a what is this uh, what's the boundary how could you tell something was not OGME? You know, so there, what happens for people who are, you want to, who are exploring, who, I don't know how to say it. It's like, there's a lot of tacit understanding of what has been constructed and how is that, how is somebody new going to be exposed to it rather than, you know, just, God, that was a really, I really hurt my head on that wall there and I didn't see a help button anywhere. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, I don't maybe, I don't know if that really makes any sense, but I think well, I, people need to help. Yeah. To learn all the work that you have put into and all the really generative thinking you've done to provide this system, which has affordances for many things, I just, you know, how can that be exposed for new people so they, you know, can take advantage of it? Partly, um, Vincent's, Vincent has picked um, a, uh, he's, he's modeling his, uh, fractal levels on something that's that's familiar to people so um so one 
adoption affordance is just it's a model that you're familiar with from living in the real world right um oh, and, it's an assertion but yeah 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 um and and it's and it's a fun one right it's got some architecture some design some um but but then another another part of adopting something like that is getting people to talk about you know okay so i need to i'm trying to categorize something and does it you know is it a group or is it uh, a collective or is it a you know i don't know you know how do we make that decision when what are the breakpoints and you end up with <clears throat> you end up with a, a feel for that that's it ends up being kind of intuitive where the you know when you have a fuzzy boundary it's it's one thing or another thing and you have to decide you get a feel for it and you have to teach that in the community or support people learning it in some way right exactly you know if you're totally confused you know and, call, and the, then call, call the concierge here and they'll, yeah, yeah. they'll help you out and then sometimes you have to negotiate, you know, as, um, you know, we need to, we've, we've accidentally started categorizing things the wrong way. And let's talk about the categorization and whether we need a new category there or, or what. So there's a whole process of main learning and growing and maintaining that kind of fractal scale. I was going to say taxonomy, but it's actually a fractal scale. Hey, Wendy. Hi guys, I'll... sorry, I'm I'm in the car today, so nice to see, nice to uh, hear the conversation. Awesome. So, Bill, you also mentioned like, uh, yeah. So, I think the analogy I would use <laughs> going with this theme is like construction sites is like are typically confusing and trove is like currently a construction site in of itself but in the future once it's kind of you know built and there's signs and there's you know directions and there's street names um <laughs> it'll be easier to navigate and then at the same time somebody might create a project which is like you know in the early stages it's like being under construction and it's like okay you see like in the real world, it's like, oh, I see this house being built. I don't really know what it's going to look like yet. I know there's a fence around it. I know generally what it's going to be doing. Maybe there's a picture of it on the on the gate of what it's going to look like. Maybe there's a phone number to call the realtor um, and either complain or get involved, or you know, maybe they're looking for um, you know people to to lease or or sublet. Um, but yeah, so I think it's having having people around um like pete said is like yeah, in the early stages like yeah the, or the, the concierge is or like you know people hanging outside um it's kind of like when you're walking around a city and you're trying to figure out your way and you just bump into someone hey like what's that building there like how do i get in i think you know having people there to bump into right then there's also like yeah you can have like an actual help desk but also just having people around that are able to like, you know, point you in the right direction is helpful. Um, but yeah, I think, um, there's, there's a lot, yeah, even just today in the, the mapping call this morning, we were talking about, yeah, like the difference between an, an organization, a project and a group and how, yeah, I basically need to define them really, really, really well um, because I, it's already starting to, to get confusing, even though there's a very clear distinction from a perspective of like how these things will interoperate with other platforms and how what sort of features each one will afford. Um, but it's not intuitive because those words obviously have like, you know, meaning behind them that each person has their own kind of understanding of what a project is. So it's difficult.
Vincent, you, uh, did you kind of get, I, did we help answer any questions for you or do you have a? Um, Bentley, I think we should, yeah, talk more about maybe some of the, yeah, I'd love to ask some, some technical questions that maybe not, maybe aren't the best for right now, but in terms of, in terms of the event stuff, yeah, I feel like there's definitely a, a need to have um, multiple calendars that people can kind of um, subscribe to. And um, yeah, and there's like two approaches. One is like the agent centric, like I have my calendar on my house and I'm choosing what's going on it. And it's just, you know, I'm gonna OAuth with my Google calendar and then any events that I say, ooh, yeah, this is my calendar, then it shows up there. And then the other way to go about it is like, you're a member of a, a group. That group does the work of curating all the events on their calendar. And then you are just subscribed to it. And so you can see everything that the group has put on their calendar. And then the third part is the, is the kind of comments. So that's like, okay, I'm interested in collective intelligence and design. So I'm going to subscribe to both of those calendars and I'm going to let the decentralized network of people that are curating events, put events on my calendar. And so those are like the three levels I would say that Trove could go in. And I, we definitely don't have the resources to go in all of them at once. So I was trying to pick one to start at least. I don't, I don't know that I have a good sense of which to pick to start. Which ones do you have right now? Um, just, you can, you can, you can, you can go to a calendar for a curated list by a group, right? Yeah, I guess I'm talking about like, right now, um, the problem is syncing with like Google Calendar um, because Google Calendar Trove has a lot of fields and information um, that Google Calendar doesn't. And so it's a lossy process to just create an event on Google and then sync it to Trove. Um, and so it's going to be a much better solution to create an event on Trove and then have it added to Google Calendar automatically. Right now I have it where it's an individual event by event basis where you can click to add it to your Google Calendar. Um, and yeah, and, and then, then we had created a calendar, which was like a Google calendar for like OGM, Kiko Lab um, on Airtable. So that was kind of like the network approach, but I think we stopped keeping it up to date and it's not pulling from Trove right now. That, that was just pulling from, uh, yeah, that was just like an Airtable with a form basically. So that's kind of where things are at right now. And there's already a community calendar on Trove and there's already a, um, you can have a list of your personal events on Trove, but I, I, yeah, I kind of want it to just be able to sync with Google quite easily. Well, I, I mean, I would suggest maybe even it's syncing and if this could, if this is getting too technical, let me know, but um, I would almost want an iCal address um, that way it's not kind of limited to Google or anything. Um, and I think that that's pretty much similar to syncing uh, in the way Google handles it. I, I don't know if there's any usability disadvantages to doing it that way. And then, so we could have your database generate the iCal data on a link, Airtable kind of does that already and then people could subscribe to whichever one they want. The iCal subscription is that, does, that will kind of like keep it up to date or is it like a one-time download this like ICS file and then upload it? And in Google, if you hit add a new ad, add a new calendar and you choose address and you put in the iCal address, it will, it will check with it periodically and keep your Google thing up to date. If not real time, I'm not sure how it works, but. Okay, um, that so actually. iCal is a syndication mechanism. 
um, and ICS is kind of the, the information that gets syndicated. But yeah. um, but the, the the general thing is that it gets refreshed. Um, Bentley, do you know other good iCal? Um, I guess Apple Calendar is good. Probably Outlook. Well, all calendaring systems suck. Today, I, I can't. I don't know how we're in 2020 and we're still in such a bad state of affairs on it. Um, yes, it is remarkable. But I, but I think iCal is pretty good. And I've been wanting to make like just an iCal aggregator service that will take several links and combine them and then a personal filtering one where you could say combine everything except unless it has this word. That might be a general tool that would be make this a little easier. Um, but I think it'd be fairly easy to set up with the Trove data and then people could just subscribe and that, even in google counter it'd be a pain but if you just had one per group then i could subscribe to each one and then turn them on in my calendar it'd be nice to have it aggregated into one but uh, it's not necessary so those are some options we can discuss and and vincent as usual if you want some of my time you can you can use my calendly link <laughs> <laughs> and set up some time. Okay, I need to move to Savvy yeah. Cow, but yeah. Uh, wait, what was it? Static Cow? I know Woven was another alternative, but they got bought out. So Savvy Cow is pretty good. It's a small startup. That one, there's no free tier, so I haven't taken the time to give the guy money. But he's a boot, he's a bootstrapper, and uh, uh, he's kind of in the no code space too. Though I don't know if he did built a custom. That'd be my preference if I had the time to move things around. It's you, it, the user experience for that from someone signing up for your calendar, I think is much better than any of the tools out there. But that's all appointments. That's not kind of what you're doing, but. Cool, okay. Yeah, thanks Bentley. Um, I know you're busy, but yeah, I'll try to find a time. Yeah, cool. Um, I wonder, I wonder maybe we should switch to, um, be interesting to talk about maps and mapping, but mm, let's defer that a little bit and maybe talk, Bill, so it's, it's interesting to ask uh, uh, next steps and milestones for Flotilla. Um, one of the things about Flotilla for me has been that it's kind of an ad hoc organization and um, so kind of to me it explicitly doesn't have goals or something like that um, it's a, just a place for for organizations to come and talk about you know individual goals uh, individual organization goals and then talk about how those might work together um, but maybe flotilla should have some outreach um, uh, maybe we should have we one of the things that Flotel has always kind of wanted to do is more data interchange um, between Massive and Trove or Trove and Factor or whatever. Um, so each I, each of our, our sovereigns are, are kind of, you know, our, I don't know, we everybody has their own roadmap and is doing their, their things at their own pace, um, but maybe we should have kind of a collective, you know, effort to do, to share personal profiles um, or or something simple. It's a good question. I don't know if the, we have any answers. I, I like the idea of, yeah, maybe having some goals in terms of outreach, um, it, just so people kind of know, know what's going on here. I also like the idea of Flotilla potentially being more of a kind of um yeah kind of working working session um i mean i'm wondering what you guys think about that but um i think we've had like a good mix of like some flotilla calls being like <laughs> let's build a map together let's like yeah. you know do a factor trove integration let's uh yeah let's let's set up a, a massive wiki like you know trover um thing and 
and then there's some other meetings that are very uh let's you know kind of the typical kind of sense making conversations around the space and updates and check ins and so and and maybe both of those types of conversations are within the the bounds of flotilla but i'm wondering what you guys think about um about that and and where whether there's more of a need of one or the other i feel like there's more of a need for the actual like space where we come together and are ready to kind of like co-build and not just talk um and it feels like that is something that's you know kind of unique in some ways to flotilla um that like you know stuff gets done so what wondering what you guys think I, I like our mix um and vincent i think you've done an amazing job at, at pushing us to actually get stuff done on some calls so thank you um i i wonder i wonder a little bit one of the challenges with that, the, the having calls that sometimes are brainstorming and sometimes, you know, working out uh, interoperability, um, and then having calls that are, are super deep technical sessions. I think one of the challenges of that is people who come by and want to attend one or the other might be frustrated by finding out, oh, today's call, we're going to be talking about, you know, Python code and JavaScript code and, and you know, OAuth or something like that. Um, so I, I don't want to chase people away by by swapping back and forth, you know, and vice versa, right? If we had a bunch of dev people going, okay, you know, so last last week we were talking about, you know, REST and Go and and APIs, and I don't know why we're talking about this, you know, cultural stuff. I don't know. I don't know if that's a problem. It's not not a problem for me, but <laughs> I'm not the usual um, attendee probably either. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, Wendy says it's interest. Uh, she likes the balance as well. Interesting to learn when it gets more technical. I th I think uh, there's there might also be space. Um, I can imagine. Uh, I can imagine um, a space for maybe kind of this call where it's. Uh, I, one of the things actually I love about Flotilla is is how varied it gets. Um, and how we have different kinds of conversations and I really like that. Um, maybe there's space for there, maybe I'll say it the other way around. There's certainly space in Massive Wiki's schedule, um, Pete's schedule for Massive Wiki to be having more um, uh, deep technical, you know, working on projects calls. Um, so maybe, maybe the, a thing to do is to add one or the other kind of call. A, a, another call during the week where that happens or where every other week or whatever. I have a totally random thing um, that technical stuff. Vincent and I are sh I share a small work project, which is currently stalled on me um, to take Zoom chat scripts and just parse out all of the, the URLs um, and setting that up as a microservice. Um, and then um, so, uh, Trove could use that to, somebody could post a chat transcript and, um, and then it could parse out a bunch of links and add those as, as item, as objects, right? Um, uh, Vincent, I want to tell you that uh, before this call, I had a call with Lorelai, and she said these Zoom transcripts drive me crazy because they've got all that metadata in it, and if I save it and look at that file, it's just junk. I can't read the text for all the, you know, uh, the the people's names and you know all of that stuff. So I'm like, dude, we could totally set up a microservice that you dump a Zoom chat transcript in, and it just strips out everything except the text, right? So, so uh, we'll add that to our bag of tricks. Um, and, so you're saying besides the links, there's also a desire to strip out the the text and the chat, right? Yeah, so that so mm -hmm. that she can actually read the text, right? right? And she actually had a really interesting option. So for me, not that. Uh, not that I'm the most important person in the world. I guess I'm kind of pretty important in my world. But for me, looking at a Zoom chat transcript, it's got enough structure, and I'm so used to, to working with text. You know, I've worked with text for decades. So 
it's easy for me to read the text or the metadata and I like the fact that it's glued together and if I need to I can always whip it into Emacs and slice and dice it and get it whatever I want out of it right so for me I never had that problem and it never even occurred to me to think about that problem so it was super amazing for Lorelei to say dude this is kind of a problem you know and I was like oh yeah I can totally see that so an option she's like and yeah and Pete you could have an option for either retaining the bullets so each message is is uh you know you can still see that it's a message or just kind of run everything together and then slice it some smart way and not even have like even the, the the metadata of individual messages is something that kind of gets in the way of her parsing that and and being able to use it for something so maybe maybe you run all the text together and slice it into paragraphs or something like that or or at least a, a thing that does annoy me i guess a thing that uh you can connect you could concatenate uh different messages by the same person right or or something like that so whole interesting so, Pete, on, on that is the use case that someone goes to a website, pastes it in, hits submit, and then something comes back and presented on the screen? Or are you talking about an API or something? Uh, Vince and I are, are this close from having a microservice where Vincent can no code, um, you know, paste uh, or uh, post, post a, um, a Zoom chat transcript and get a, re a reply that's just URLs. So then um, uh, Wendy Elford and I are also talking about a uh, text tools website um, where you can go and get different transformations and that would have a, a front end rather than it's just back end. Yeah. So we've talked about having a, a front end where you can uh, do different de text transformations, um, you know, summarizing or coalescing or organizing or whatever. Yeah, tell me if I'm getting too technical again, but I mean, if I was going to do that, I would I would build that all in JavaScript and then you can host the website and not have to have a back end. Yeah. That all could be done. And yeah. then if you want to have a back end, you just throw that JavaScript up into a Cloudflare worker or some, some yeah, other thing. That's really smart. Um, but I know you're not, you're probably not JavaScript fluent enough to make that friendly, but that's something I do a lot of text parsing. So I would, yeah. I would enjoy making that. It'd be interesting to make one where you paste it in. And then you can toggle the buttons that says show the names, show the dates and times, or show nothing, or come, you know, take out. Yeah. yeah. That'd be a lot of fun. Yep. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, I used to have, uh, I, I used to be mostly in Node, and so I used to have that JavaScript. But right now, the microservice is written in Python. You've guessed it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I figured And, and is thing, maybe yeah. going to turn into a Lambda, um, I hope. But yeah. Not that far, yeah. I'm wondering, yeah, probably not worth rewriting to get. I, I'm just wondering yeah, whether I, people want that too. Although if I'm going to build that thing, I might as well also, not that I, I don't have that. If someone was going to build that in JavaScript, then it, also having it extract the links would be something that's useful. Yeah, I so so the way I think of writing in Python is it's scaffolding for doing it a better way at some point, right? Um, I've got the, actually the same problem, uh, not to uh, getting technical again, I guess it's not a problem to be technical. Um, uh, I've got code that does uh, massive wiki stuff, um, right? Uh, it can change. I think I've got code. Um, I've, I've or at least big chunks of the code that would take a GitHub repo and turn it into a massive wiki in real time. Um, uh, and it's in Python. Uh, so the obvious thing to do is actually to rewrite that in JavaScript and run it on the client side, right? Um, so you should have a, I should have, Massive Wiki should have um, a JavaScript client in the browser that you can just point at a, at a GitHub repo and it reads it not as a repo, but as a website, right? HTML website. There's yeah. some, some third party, there is, there is a pretty code that does pretty close to that too. Anyway, That's cool. but, but either way, it's like, you know, develop it in, in whatever language, and then you have at least a good prototype for doing it with the right architecture. So that's a pattern I'm using. And Jerry was asking about projects that we think we could like crowdfund, maybe this making a website to convert to Zoom 
stuff into useful data is a is one of those. I mean, very small. It's like a 10, 20 hour thing, right? But they've done yeah. a good experiment for that project thing that Jerry's talking about. Yep. Thanks. That's a good idea. I mean, I would put some money towards that. <laughs> <laughs> Only a hundred bucks an hour. I could find cheaper people though. <laughs> We should probably look at, yeah, innings. Yeah, I could, I could put in a few hundred bucks. Um, that seems like it'd be valuable use of um, some funds. But yeah, like, yeah, for me, once I have the list of links, then Bentley, the, the piece that you had helped with, now I'm sure you see how it connects. Then it's basically you paste the Zoom uh, into Trove and then Trove's event page will automatically have uh, all of the links from that event and it'll basically go to the website it'll pull the image the title the description and then it'll have a little resource card for each link in like a little gallery grid below the event where you can go back to any event and see like all the different websites and resources and then you know you can go and you can categorize those and you can add more context to those links afterwards yeah that'd be awesome I, and another thing right in this spot is we already have microservices that you give it a link and it'll, it'll give you back a nice title, right? Or a nice um, unfurl, the way Slack calls it. Um, but some of those don't handle um, something like the brain. So I've got code from meme brain. Um, actually, my link extractor knows how to find a decent title out of out of places where it's a little bit difficult, like the brain. So, um, so that needs a mashup or something where you can give the uh, the more established service that does a decent job on on almost all the the sites. Uh, you want to grab it from. I guess I guess you want to have a, a couple different kinds of summarizers and and title grabbers and stuff like that. And sometimes you have to pick one or the other depending on. On the link, there's a similar issue with images too. Yeah, logo versus the, you know, OG image versus the, uh, <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. there's a few, a few different variables there. Bentley and I were playing with that. Got kind of complicated. Yeah. Yeah, there's a good service that's good at picking one, but it'd be nice to have one that returned all the options, and then you could choose. You know, have a human choose on a case by case basis because yep. the web's just too inconsistent. Yep. And I guess that's another potential project, although that one probably get less funding because it's more back endy than user facing, but. Um, what do you think, Bill? Did we talk enough around, um, we, we got sidetracked uh, uh, talking about microservices, but did we talk around flotilla next steps well enough or? I made a note earlier about, so I like the idea about just, you know, having a mix at the primary tasks at the meetings and someplace for at least the participating participants, whatever, whether, you know, sovereign projects or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty loose. I think it's, you know, it seems to work. Um, as long as it's solvent, you know, I don't know. I'm just, uh, there's only so much time in the world. So as long as uh, <laughs> getting together, you know, is, has productive the, yeah well or useful in some yeah even in a social whatever any number of domains um, um reminds me in a in a recent uh, meeting i i talked about having um uh metrics for meetings at the end of it you could score it on you know productiveness or usefulness or um 
number of introductions amongst people who didn't know each other before or or things like that well i like the last one because when i was doing this international scientific data work you know people would always be like well why are you getting all these people together in south africa blah 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 we had a very good protocol for actually having two or three day meetings that really produced useful reports some of which really were acted on post but you know the real reason people get together is just to get together because we're people yeah i mean that's the main reason you pay for a conference yeah and the best conference i went to was a small one in in sweden where the coffee breaks were like 45 minutes long because swedish yeah. coffee and that's what we're here for <laughs> it's the coffee break not so much to talk yep so you know yeah. i think there's a you know given the we just have to be sensitive to what we're trying to accomplish i mean bentley brought this up in the ogm world and i think that's you know still to be determined Um, maybe uh, should we talk a bit about maps and mapping, um, Wendy? I don't I don't know if this is going to be frustrating or not. Um, sure, that would work. <laughs> I'm uh, home now. I'm home now. So oh, awesome. I need to keep my video off, but I can I can definitely chime in now. Awesome. Um, so Wendy did a cool map, um, and oh, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> and a little thing. Yeah, the little thing with the you know. The... <laughs> Um, and I helped her drag it over to Mattermost, um, which is which is the best mapping maps and mapping community I know about right now. Um, it's still that community is not really it. We we don't there isn't really a community there. It's a proto community. It, it could be a community maybe. So Wendy and I ended up in a conversation this week a little bit about um, you know uh, it, should we should we help it be more of a community um, and. It's interesting. I went back today a little bit early on the call, and somebody put. Um, it, it's interesting looking at the the way that it's kind of been assembled. Um, Charles made the channel, which was really cool. Um, Bill's got the tagline: um, "A place where the maps are the territory." Wait, what? Um, and I think maybe it's Jerry put a link to mapwhispers.com, um, and. Uh, I, th I think that's Jerry's website, but it's uh, all the links out of it to um, uh, to Dig Life and someplace else. Um, open Learning; uh, the, those links are broken, so um, so it's not quite together. Uh, and I, I wonder if it. I, I wonder if we should make it more of a community um, with its own website. And and uh, Wendy and I were talking about repositories where to keep. Uh, files like PNGs and uh, scalpel files and whatever, uh, we ended up settling on the idea of a shared Google folder um, that then um, I can syndicate or aggregate or trans export uh, over to Massive Wiki. I think Vincent could um, map a lot of it in Trove. Um, but, but anyway, I guess that's as far as we got is maybe there should be a community. And maybe, maybe we should start pushing for that. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, that's going to be where I'm living for the next six months or more. So I would love to have a space where we could dive in. And I know some of that's already happening in terms of chat, but to make it more productive, I think my question would be how many other people are really interested in that view of things that would find it useful to not just have a, some side conversations happening, but really put more focused attention on it. What do you guys think? Um, I think, uh, I, th I think there's a lot of people who are interested in it. Um, and I also think that it's one of those bootstrap things where it's hard for people 
to be interested in it because there, you know, there isn't, there isn't a place. Um, there isn't a place to talk about what maps and mapping means. And here's some examples that I did. You know, I, the, the channel is better than nothing, but um, we don't have a culture of, of really being together in that channel yet. We don't have a weekly call, um, although it looks like there used to be one from Dig Life. Um, uh, so I, I think we should do, I think we should push on making it more of a community and getting it more, um, we should make more uh, stone soup that, or we should make a bigger pot or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's interesting to me because, you know, I felt isolated and in, in thinking this way and I've met more people who are trying to take large chunks of data and use design to, um, to make sense of that data rather than coming at a design, a mapping kind of design as a way to interact with the data. So um, to me, there's a distinction there that I'm only, I've only just come to appreciate as I talk to more people who are in development. Um, it makes perfect sense, right? That, that the world went and became like huge amounts of data, of course. And then people say, well, we can't do anything with this. And we need to make more sense of it in order to make decisions based on it. I think that that's a whole world unto itself. But I'm realizing that's not really what I'm talking, you know, what I'm curious about, what I'm trying to design for. Um, I think some of those designs are helpful as a, as a starting point in terms of conversation. But if we're talking about using a design that a mapping design is a different way to think and to enable things like creativity or connection or um, self-knowledge or self-growth or actualization or any of those things, which is really more the angle that I'm coming at it from, um, then it's actually, a seems to me like it's turning into a completely different thing. It reminds me that you should talk to Virgins, um, which is Phil and More Life and uh, Mark Thibault. Um And they're also working with um, uh, Julian uh, uh, from FJB, and um, they've got they've got some some overlap and some very different stuff, but uh, the the kind of the general the general pitch that they have is um, uh, if we spatialize interaction and knowledge um, and collaboration um, in AR actually. Um, then the world would be a better place. So there's a there's a similarity between what they're doing. What what they're saying is spatialized and visualized, you know, information, knowledge, collaboration, conversation, um, centered around places. Actually, for because they're they're spatializing things, um, is a different way of thinking about things, and you know, activates different collaboration modalities that are that are very human. You know, humans have been spatializing for tens of, or hundreds of thousands of years. So it's, it's got some similarities and, and their, their aims and goals in helping people adopt that are similar, even though mm -hmm. their front end is much different than yours, I think, kind of. Yeah, that is interesting. What, what was the name of it again? Uh, Virgins. Virgins, okay. Um, and where were y'all two just talking about? Was that Mattermost and, or no? What was the community site? Uh, for uh, right now, map, maps and mapping, the, the thing where we're all participating is just the maps and mapping channel on, um, on, on Mattermost. Oh, okay. um, right. Jerry had put a link sure to mapwhispers.com, uh, which is a more bun site right now. It's, it's a zombie site, but. Uh, and then that points off to broken links in dig life and um uh and open learning oh i see i was curious do y'all would y'all consider my gully project mapping or not because it's only semi-visual and i can show it real quick if you want to give me your opinion i, I would not um it's, it's definitely more related classification and categorization right instead of visualization yeah. Well, map, mapping doesn't have to be visualization, I think. Um, uh, it's, but it's, I guess it's at least, so I map um, in Wiki, right? Um, by making lists of things and headers and pages and stuff like that. 
um, it doesn't it's not much of a visualization but it's like but it does have um, metaphor of diagrams and things like that and, and actually I do mix in diagrams Vincent you've had your hand up I well I'd also like to answer Bensley's I actually think I would consider it a uh, type of mapping um, so like topic quest um, like you know that type of mapping has an overlap with the kind of like argument mapping. I feel like argument mapping is a subset, uh, like a sub sect of mapping, which goalie bot fits into. Um, uh, but I feel like- actually called argument mapping, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's technically mapping. Um, yeah, I don't know what, what do you guys, uh, Wendy, do you know about the project? Or Bill? Yeah, no, I'm not familiar. I think uh, I heard of it. But... So you should uh, you should do a demo of Bentley. Yeah, Bentley, why don't you do a um, little screen share? Awesome. Bentley, you're muted. So yeah, like uh, like Vincent was saying, it's it's argument mapping. Um, so it's taking a very complex issue like. This one making a personal decision whether you should take the vaccine and it's gathering all the information and then putting it into a hierarchy so that you don't have to read through the whole thing um so it, it is kind of an argument map meant to be having all points of views fairly represented and well documented um yeah so it kind of fits mapping i was just when y'all were saying mapping i wasn't sure what what this what the scope of that was so I, I like a broad scope. So I'm yeah. not, I, there, there are mapping like activities here, I think, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't yeah. call this mapping quite. Um, but I, I also don't want to, I'm not trying to be prescriptive about that. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, I think we should, it, it does, there is definitely mapping going on here. I, I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. So would, would this be more decision tree does that make sense or is that too minimalistic it uh, technically term? doesn't fall under decision tree because this decision tree is where you're going through a path and making a final decision based upon forks um, and this is an argument map where uh, it's just breaking down the pros and cons of well it, pros and cons imply it is a decision making it doesn't fit under the decision tree yeah, um, I got you. By the right. technical term, yeah. Yeah, because it's allowing you to dig down into into the different yeah. arguments, basically, the different yeah. perspectives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ben. This is fun to see. Wendy, I, I wonder, um, <laughs> I'm thinking about it, though, because you mentioned decision tree. I feel like, I don't know if this is what you were trying to get to, but uh, the goalie bot, like, map every time you go down a layer then there's like you know four or five different points sometimes underneath that layer so i'm wondering bentley if you've thought about actually mapping out those arguments as a tree instead of like a yeah a two uh instead of like a one-dimensional uh like timeline actually having it be like a yeah. kumu graph well this is i mean technically that that's a tree <laughs> I'm getting all pedantic. So it's it's a good it's the Microsoft Drive folder format where you have a little you can open and close branches, right? So it's right, a tree. right, right. But to do it more like a graph where you have a center thing and things spidering out and stuff like that, yeah. And this is just one visualization, but to, but it is technically a graph and not a tree. Um, but yes, a, a a graph display like there is debate graph, which is very similar, um, but displays the graph. But this is just one visualization of the data, and I plan to have quite a few, including like a scale where you can see the weights of the different arguments. Um, uh, so yeah, this is just one visualization. So it is, it's not a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a graph, yeah. I don't know, I lost track of where I was going there, but hopefully it, it was informative. I, I I feel like there's there's a there's definitely it, it there is a map, but as a user, I don't feel like I see the map. Like you're you've done a, a, a simplifying thing, which is to help me see a path in a larger map, um, and that's great. But I don't see the whole map. 
So yeah, there's there's that's part. Of, there's gonna be other UIs like one where you can leave the tree open if you want, yeah. and another one, you know, kind of the the um, spider diagram graph database kind of floaty buttons and stuff like that, um, yep. where you can see the whole thing. It's just at that point, it, it actually is useless. Um, yeah. Or not useless. It's less valuable than being able to focus, but there might be some uses to it. Yeah, this was just the one that I thought was most useful. One, one use is to see the scale of, of the argument, right? And mm -hmm. then be able to zoom out and say, okay, I want it, I want to center back in on a part of the, the space. This is, so map maps and mapping is all about trade-offs, right? Representing right. Um, lots of information and in different ways from different viewpoints and at different scales. Yeah, the multiple views is very important because yeah, because you think about it, like even like Google Maps, you get different levels of detail depending on how close you are. So that's yeah. all important. Yeah. Bill, your hand is up. Um, let me get rid of the hand here. So this, I think this is really important. I like, so I had two observations. One, I worked for Xerox for a long time and they had spent a lot of time in the in the research laboratory at Park, building up a decision tree that would allow technicians to diagnose these complex, you know, printing machines when they broke down. What really happened is that the printers would meet every morning for coffee and they would basically say, oh yeah, this printer, yeah, forget what it says on that page. This is the problem. Because in the AI laboratory at Park, they thought that they could actually specify so you wouldn't really need any human judgment and you would find the problem. However, you know, machines are made out of, you know, they're not, they're not bits. They're actually made out of atoms. And sometimes, you know, this particular part for this particular machine never comes off the assembly line, right? So um, it was a lot of, uh, it was a big anthropological study about what it really takes to, you know, they thought they would, they thought they were going to de-skill this uh, repair technician. So there is this kind of funky idea that floats around. And the other observation I've had years ago is that if you have a connected graph, especially stuff about an organization, if you want a hierarchy, all you need to do is pick up one node and shake, and it will look like a hierarchy <laughs> kind of from the node you're holding. I mean, that's a little facetious, but there is this piece that um, depending how you want to examine it, and it was a couple of weeks. Oh, on the last Kiko Lab call, there was uh, Tom uh, Nixon from the UK had this map TIO thing. Yeah. For doing this, what he called organizational charts, which was like totally the wrong name. But it, very interesting that when he did it, it reminded me of a Edward Tufte kind of visualization. There's an organization you can look at it like this as a bunch of, you know, Sets with sets of groups of people within groups within, or you can look at it between as connections amongst these groups of people, or you can look at it this other way. So, and for me personally, I've used mind maps a lot for really examining, you know, articles and being able to really tease out what is the structure and what's the important part. And I was just uh, started to read Annie Murphy Paul's recent book on the extended mind, which is all about basically using our lived environment to actually externalize how we learn things, which also has to do with creating connections among the words on a page and post-its on the wall. And so I, I don't know, I think it's a pretty, and in the 21st century, I mean, we are in the network century. This is what we're talking about. Networks of people as opposed to hierarchies of power or networks of people embedded in hierarchies of power. But, you know, we are really pushing the network um, model of how to work collectively, collaboratively, less competitively. Um, so I think, you know, the visualizations and um, both theoretical and other tools to manage these uh, uh, representations of relationships are critical. I mean, it's what we're doing now. It's how we actually try to, we're trying to think 
I'm just speaking from my own life. I'm trying to unlearn the ways I was taught to actually think about things. And we are all trying to think about things differently. So perhaps we could come up with, you know, a practicable solution. That's probably a good example of OGME. <laughs> well, maybe I should write that down. But no, but no, but I don't. But you know what I mean. Earlier yeah. when I was talking, it's like mm -hmm. the real question about you know is something OGME is being able to say. You see that thing over there? Yeah. That World Bank. That's not. And it's like, okay, that's interesting. I guess. Show me the work. Show yeah. show your work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, we should get there at some point, or at least closer. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Wendy, this was to support you. It's all about, you know, in terms of learning and trying to actually make sense of, for me, my own personal knowledge about what's happening. I think the mapping thing is really, uh, well, important and useful. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate your perspective. And it's um, inspiring for me, too similar as, you know, meeting Vincent and realizing we were thinking a lot of these same things. And I think any mapping or connecting or community software that makes you realize you're not alone in thinking the way you're thinking is always a good thing. <laughs> and so it's spurring me on. I, I, um, I, yeah, so I, I've gotten, I think, good suggestions from this group and from a couple other conversations about what my next step should be in this project. And I think I'm very aligned and incredibly motivated to do those things. I wish I could do them faster with where my life is, but, um, but that'll change soon enough. And, um, and um, I'm, I'm really excited and I, and I'm really glad that you all see uh, benefits to this type of view on things. Um, and I'm excited to see even with just some basics, what, what that might spur on in terms of our conversation and, how things might overlap between visualizing things and the other projects that are already in play. Well, just to add something, I put together when I was teaching, I put together a website, which is a bunch of mind maps, which I was almost trying to figure out how to publish it as, a, as an annotated bibliography of important papers to read if you're interested in scientific data informatics. Rather than just writing a bibliography, I wanted to post these maps of the articles. So I couldn't find a way to do it. I, mean, I love that. Do you still have them? Yeah, I think it's still online. I'll I'll send the I'll see if I can post the link right now. Um, yeah, or, not, or if even, not, I'll post it later. Yeah, or put it into Mattermost, the the maps and mapping channel, so that we don't lose track of the link. Mm. What do you okay. think of that? I, I like yeah. it. I like it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I think those are perfect examples of how we were using what we had and let's see if we can make it better. Right. So it become like I have documents that I put together, whether it was for COVID or other things, where I've done tons of research trying to help people get to solutions or ideas or or things that they needed. Right. And it was really just a research project that were that I published out to people through Google Doc um, to help help them and um, just get resources and stuff. Um, Cause that's all we had, right? That's, that's all we have to work with. And so of course it's linear and it's got a table of contents cause that's the best that I could do with what I had. I would love to see that be put in a tree. So I think some of map and mapping uh, that conversation could be helped no matter who's working on it with uh, this. I would love for this insert, whatever. I would love for this topic, this content this document to be able to be mapped. I think there'd be a lot of value to mapping this and posting it to each other. I think that's, um, I, I find that interesting. And then the more examples that fit into a particular design scheme, the more we'll know we're onto something. Yes. Sorry, he sent me off uh, down there. I can find this thing. Well, I'll put the link here, but I'll put it in the Mattermost. It's kind of, I really had a lot of fun with this. <laughs> I'll put it in the Mattermost with a little, a little few sentences about what I was trying to do. Um, Wendy, uh, um, 
I've got an idea and let's talk about it more. Um, uh, uh, it would be fun to make a massive. I, so we talked about having a, a shared fo a, a shared folder in Google for um, files and stuff like that. I think that's still important, but um, I'm starting to think about the explanations around those artifacts, um, and and then it, that turns for me into a wiki. So I'd be interested to talk to you about you know, making a massive wiki of examples of maps and mapping and you know all that kind of stuff. Yeah, then I I can easily see how that would be a wiki. If that makes sense to you, then I'm on board. Well, would you uh, would you be able to help me some putting it together? Yeah. So my um, for me, every this my my time opens up tremendously. Like first second week of September. Right now, my time for this is about down to about three or four hours a week, which is just probably where it's going to need to sit until, um, until yeah, the end of August, probably. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. So, but then we'll, after we'll keep that, it going until then. Yeah, it's it's either a part time or full time job for me. So, um, so I'm happy to keep doing my thing and you, you, I'm okay if this group or other groups want to focus on other pieces or if you, if this stuff keeps moving along because it interests you, um, and then I can come, you know, I can add more of my, my thoughts when September comes, all of that's okay with me. I, I don't mind one way or the other, just so that you guys know, I'm not trying to ignore or, or I'm not falling away from it. It's just where my time's at for the moment and that's it won't totally last. Fair. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm envisioning a map of your time and availability over the next couple of months in, inter overlaid with everybody else's similar maps of, of the next couple of months. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah. But um, so in that to that end, do you think <clears throat> from your perspective, Pete, do you think starting with massive wiki makes more sense? Or starting for me and my time? Or does it make more sense for me to start doing the visuals? Right, that and and I I'm leaning towards the visuals, right? Of starting I, to get what you, I'm seeing. I, okay. I think for you the visuals. Um, I think for the community, and I think I think this would be a good thing for you to participate in, or or maybe even push. Um, mm -hmm. I can kind of push the idea of of well, let me back up. Um, I I think of the maps and mapping channel, and I think of. Um, uh, we've had some really cool maps posted in there, right? And um, there's one in particular, a, a tiny one that I did of, of a conversation. Um, and I actually did it not, it was the opening of GM conversation and I didn't do it because I wanted to post a map. I did it because I wanted the ch opening OGM channel to be able to see what happened in, in a conversation because it, it exploded real fast, right? And if you didn't read every message, you wouldn't know that the that the conversation even happened, right? Um, so I, I mapped that, and then I think I posted it in Maps and Mapping, although I can't find it right now. Um, and then, so in the process of thinking about that map, and I wish I could share that, you know, I'm scrolling through. There's a bunch of other cool maps and Maps and Mapping. Um, and even in this call, we've talked about examples of mapping and stuff like that. Um, Bill's shared his his cool thing, um, you know. So the channel has been super important as a way to at least get people all kind of in the same room. But because it's a chat, it scrolls off, right? So um, if we had a um, chat and wikis go together, like peanut butter and chocolate or something. Um, if there were a place where it was a growing, you know, a, a growing archive of stuff and not just the artifacts themselves, but an explanation of why this artifact or, or a curation of, you know, here's a bunch of concept maps, here's a bunch of mind maps, here's a bunch of, you know, uh, visualized graphs, um, having those pages start to grow around the artifacts um, I think is is a it, it's a good community building thing. It's a good knowledge building thing. It's a good way to start letting people talk about. Oh, there's this cool map that right. And right now you just kind of point off into the ether. Um, 
Uh, by the way, I, I think the, the the main problem I see in maps and mapping, um, it's it's interesting to look at it from the perspective of you know, so we've had a bunch of tries of people with too much data trying to make sense of it, and so they make a map. It's really cool to turn that around and say, hey, how about if we start as with the visualization as the way of thinking, right? And and then, yeah, maybe it'll bump into lots of data, but the point is actually the sense making around the visualization. I think that's a really good perspective. Um, for both of those, we've had a dearth of, um, of literacy. Uh, so um, the problem that we solved for language and especially text-based language by having books and libraries and writing courses and um, uh, novel analysis courses and things like that. We have a we have a framework where we teach humans how to um, uh, mediate language through text, right? And it's not a natural skill. It's something that you teach people, um, and people learn um, by watching examples and things like that, right? So, in the mapping world, we don't really have good grammar books and good you know, textbooks and good um, libraries. Uh, we, you know, the, and, and I can kind of point to the exceptions as, uh, the exceptions that prove the rule, right? There's the Tufty books, you know, and the Tufty courses. And that's like, you know, I've just described like, you know, a quarter or maybe a tenth or a hundredth of the space when there should be, we should have like, a thousand Tufties, the way that we have a thousand novelists. We should have a thousand, you know, libraries where you can go and look at different kinds of maps and stuff like that. So a big part of the reason that we haven't been doing it well is because we haven't been doing it well and we haven't been showing each other how to do it, right? So that's kind of the, the space for me. This gets better the, the more that we do it and the more that we do it together and the more that we share and the more that we teach each other this is one kind of map, this is another kind of map. Uh, what, what is a map, you know, is Gully Bottom a map is a great question to talk about, you know, what's a map, what's mapping, um, what's the different kinds of visualizations. So all of that conversation is stuff that we need to do more of to be able to do more of it. And the reason that we're not doing more of it is because we're not doing it very much. Thank you. That was really helpful, actually, you know, in, in helping me see from all your expertise and your background and your experience in talking about these things already, um, where different people's perspectives will be coming from. So, yeah, thank you. I think that's really useful, especially as we move into more and more conversations around it to recognize all the different ways. I, I needed that to recognize all the different ways in which yeah. the term mapping will be used and to help help us all start to discern and maybe even come up with some new language so we can make more sense out of what, what we're even just trying to work towards. Yep. Is there a Behance for maps? Yeah, no Behance. <laughs> um, for, I, I've seen those for great geographical maps. Um, I've seen one or two for like system diagram kinds of maps. So it's not like a, a visual there, thinking. No, there, there is actually. Um, hold on. Oh. And I have a list of all of those. <laughs> you have a map of map of map. Tools. I do. Yeah. Of course I mean, he does. Because <laughs> he's amazing that way. I actually think, uh, Wendy, this might be the same link I sent you in Telegram. So I might copy it from there. I don't know if you. Yeah, is this uh, the Airtable? Yes. Um, okay. Could you paste that link in here if, if you have it? Um, trying yeah, hold to... on a sec. The one Next that, um, the best one that I know of is, um, information is beautiful, which is information is, is beautiful.net. And it's basically a behance for <laughs> visualizations and maps. Um, okay, yeah, I think yeah, I have it. I just need to do it on my phone. Was, 
Yeah, that's hard. That's the one I was. I think I'd, I'd somewhere back in my brain I'd seen this. And then, yeah, if I wanted to hire, see, I guess that's more, this is more data viz than, well, a lot of it's data viz as opposed to mapping. But for Gullybot, I eventually want to have some people help out with how to visualize it. So if y'all would recommend anyone, I'm probably not to that point yet, but. some point that'd be something i'll be looking for i found a way to get the link from my phone thanks wendy <laughs> uh yeah so i just posted the yeah wendy and i both posted the link to the air table that has um a bunch of mapping and visualization tools cool uh goalie bots on there yeah <laughs> so although <laughs> i think like, i, I recognize still, that purple guy I, although it's it's with one l right uh no it's two l's it's gullible Oh, okay, it's I had it right. The same as gullible, except instead of the last LE, it's OT. And it's okay, good. I spelled it right. Okay. First name, last name. Did you know it was last year that they changed the spelling of gullible in the dictionary? Oh, no. What was it before that? <laughs> Seriously? It's, oh, it's a, okay. it's a meta yeah. joke. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Oh, no. wow. It's like, oh, I see. Yeah, I'm gonna go on some gullible <laughs> go on some gullible travel soon. So. <laughs> but the funny thing is, is that I'm always like, I'm I'm happy being gullible. <laughs> I often don't have the time. So in high school, people always got me all the time, and I'm like, you know, I, gullibility I is a is a superpower. Not not to. You're right. It's trust. Oh, yeah. there's a there's a map of rhetorical fallacies. I wonder Sorry. if it is. I, okay, wonder so, if it, I wonder if it is one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have to ask how is Cora a map from your perspective, Vincent, that you put that on here? Or did somebody else put that on here? Yeah. So, argument map. I tagged Cora as a, let's see, what were the types? Um, as a tool for collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. And argument mapping uh, tool is what yeah. you put. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did. I did. That's, yeah. Yeah. Well, because yeah, you ask questions and yep. then people give different answers. Um, yeah. Right. So it's technically mapping out arguments to a question. It's not great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, it's so interesting, it's an, interesting to think about distinction yeah so I, I would definitely say that they they are doing mapping but they don't present a map is the way that i would say it i don't even know if it really falls into mapping because it's really here's one thing and there's a single relationship type in a single direction question and answer you mean sorry question answer kind of well yeah right so at least in Golibot, there's a there's a pro or a con there's some data on mm. the on it, there's a relate there's a key to the relationships and i think that that's where i would put the line for mapping is that it otherwise it's just a list well i don't know but peter was saying a list is a map so yeah a list is a map the thing the thing is cora puts them all so like the one thing about cora is that they don't make it easy to see the connections but they're there cuz like if you ask a question then you scroll down, you see all the other questions that it knows are super similar to that question. And so it, it kind of maps questions. Like that's their database. They have a giant map of all the questions and how those questions are either the same question or similar questions or related. Um, so, I, and I feel this way with a lot of things like YouTube is an incredible, like YouTube probably has one of the most incredible maps of knowledge, yet it's like, the, the ways that they show it to you is like, you know, dumbing it down for like a, you know, four-year-old because a four-year-old could navigate YouTube. So they, there's no advanced pro view of YouTube where you can like, 
uh, <laughs> you know, see how everything is all connected. I wish there was. Um, Yeah, and when you think about how every answer in Quora 2 has the opportunity for people to link out to whatever they want, whether it's another Quora answer or something external or whatever, um, when you include all of that too, then it's, it's incredibly complex network. Folks, yeah, I apologize, I've gotta go. Um, is it time to, I, does somebody else want to take host or should we fold the call? Well, I got to go too. So anyway. Yeah, I got to go too. It's, it's been a great. great call, folks. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we should uh, definitely talk more about the mapping community thing the next call or, or sometime soon. Yeah. More than one word for map. We need it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and maybe I should invite, so there was like nine or 10 people that showed up to a mapping call this morning. Uh, yeah. And I think like those people, I haven't, a lot of new faces too. So I'm wondering if we should yeah, send an email to that group saying, hey, join Mattermost for now, or if we should, yeah, figure it out later. I, I I'm open to that, a, but. I think we should make a community and then, yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway, let's keep talking. In the, in what the was the um, what was the umbrella under which people were talking about mapping this morning? Was it a special call just for that, or was it uh, under Wendy, under want, another could, project? I know a few people have to go, so I can hang on for a minute okay. or two and uh, give you a, a debrief of that. So, um, yeah, I'm maybe going to stop recording though. Oh, I can't yeah, stop no, recording. That's, yeah, that's okay. I, I think Pete had to go too, so. Um, I was just curious. I thought it was both um, answer. You, but... you should uh, you should hear Vincent's. Uh, I I made you uh, host Vincent, and I'll leave. And uh, oh, okay, good. Thank you. I'll catch up later. <laughs>